Hey, I got you. Hey, can there, hope everybody can hear me. And uh, welcome back to those who just finished our, our strength workout. Um, I think Jen and Eunice did a did a, uh, a phenomenal job, and looking forward to what they have in store for Thursday. Although we'll have Ian Huang there uh, as our featured athlete. So, um, so I'm real excited uh, to to feature our, our next guest, and um, who was. Uh, uh, we really appreciate taking time out of his busy day to join us, and um, and that is Chris Peterson. And Chris is he's been at the the center of the sport for almost 30 years, um, uh, dating back to the mid 80s. 1984, he joined Jerry Smith, handcrafted medals, and and started building racing chairs, and and connected with George Murray. And those two then split off, started their own company in 1986, Top End, and uh, um, built chairs and innovated and created and, and designed and, and pushed the sport forward for, for decades. And then in, in 2015 started his latest venture, which is, is carbon bike and, and uh, still building racing chairs and doing a really good job of, of, of that. So, um, so this guy knows his stuff and, and, uh, um, and uh, is an incredible resource and, and we're really thankful and uh, fortunate that, that he spent a little time with us today. So, um, I'm going to hand it back over to Chris and let him kind of take the reins and then uh, feel free. I know he wants to keep it loose and open. So as you guys have questions, just push those through and, and I'll interject when, uh, when it's appropriate and I'll, I'll shoot those question, uh, questions Chris's way. Um, so Chris, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, the floor is yours, my friend. You hear me now? I can hear you, can, and you can hear, okay, just one second. Okay, anyway, um, yeah, great to have you guys uh, invite me, and uh, yeah, it's really cool what's going on. It's unfortunate with this whole situation with the pandemic, uh, but in a way, it's kind of interesting that a lot of resources are being reached out to to educate people, and uh, there's a lot of people over the years done a lot of stuff and I've been involved in many many of them uh, you know with different people I mean and uh, it's really good to see this getting uh, spread out in history or even new things um, you know so it's pretty neat because we we wouldn't have been doing this if we wouldn't have this pandemic situation honestly everybody would just be training and going to track meets or going to peach tree last a couple other day or whatever so it's kind of a whole new thing and it's quite educational for me too because i i know one of my weaknesses is maybe not sharing things i know uh, over the years but it kind of gives an opportunity uh, for people to do that and not just me but other people um, so it's pretty good so uh yeah like adam said i uh i got into this into this business a long time ago in New York, actually, where I grew up. I ended up working in a home care store where I delivered hospital beds, oxygen tanks, all that commodes, et cetera. And mostly it was to elderly people, more of the Medicare kind of people. But then along the way, uh, they were a progressive enough company to uh, hire some different people and try to get into rehab. And, uh, Marty Ball uh, was hired and there to do uh, a small section of the company, Exchange to Mobility Unlimited was the name of the company. And I met him and I met George Murray, uh, Gary Kerr, all those people in, in the early 80s that came up and did a race. And to me, it was fascinating um, in a way for me to do something, uh, you know, to get moving on and I kind of just gravitated moved to Florida, uh, worked for Jerry Smith, like you said, uh, with George Murray, and other people came down there, and we built a lot of different chairs, and then for whatever reason, we started Top End in 1986, me and George, and, uh, and we were just trying to make anything new, and everybody else was too, there was a ton of people making chairs, and, you know, I don't know, there was probably 10 people in the United States making racing chairs at that time. Two, I guess. So, it, uh, but anyway, it was a great time. Every day we made, tried to make a better chair better than the last one we made. And that's 
time was coming through. So that's kind of what happened. And then, yeah, we started work and then I got connected with Invacare as a company that got bigger after the, the Barcelona Paralympics was the first ones I went to. And that was an eye opener. And, uh, and it was wheelchair racing was big. Yeah, it was a lot going on, and the bigger companies jumped in on it. In the care, Sunrise Medical, called Shadow, uh, which was with Jim Martinson, and bike companies were dabbling with it. And, uh, so anyway, that's kind of where it ended up, and then we just moved on. And then, yeah, now it's, I'm with Carbon Bike, but still doing the same thing. But I'm focused more on the racing chairs and the high end hand side. That's... That's where we are right now. So I uh, I have a little list here. Adam asked me to talk about, so I will uh, go along that. Um, anybody wants to ask questions, feel free to do it along the way. Um, but uh, significant changes in the chairs. I think the biggest one, at least in my time frame, was. When we switched from four wheels to three wheels, that was huge. Um, and that was around the 88 time. I think it was a rule change. Uh, you couldn't, you, know, you had to have four wheels and, and then they raced on the track, you know, with two wheels close together, sometimes one wheel not touching the ground, all kinds of things happening. But then it, once it changed to three wheels, the speed seemed like really jumped um and it was the chairs were safer which seemed to be kind of backwards in a way because three-wheel golf carts are way more dangerous than four-wheel golf carts but the racing chair actually is a lot safer and uh and they also allowed us to make the chairs longer i think the original rule was 48 inch long overall length so the chairs were so short if you went down the hill, it was like crazy. So I think that one was the biggest one, although before that steering devices were on the four wheelers, that made a huge impact too. But I think switching from four wheels to three wheels made a much bigger difference. I think the four wheel concept is pretty much worn out. We tried steering devices, cambered front wheels, close together, wheels far apart, it was just better. One wheel in front, make the chair longer, and it was easier. Um, and uh, so that explains that. <laughs> that explains that about the, my, at least what I thought. Um, and then uh, positioning has also been a huge part of what goes on, because even guys with the old chairs, if you look at some of these pictures on the history of uh, wheelchair sports, you see some people that are sitting in really good positions, but the chair is off wall. Or you see people in bad positions, chairs not so bad. But it just kind of all came together. It's interesting to see over time how so many people try different things um, that didn't always work, but they were trying it. So now we've evolved. I guess since I've been in it, I guess 30 years, it's kind of narrowed down to what we have now. And it's, now it's, it's a little bit more professional. It's definitely more professional. Uh, the chairs are made better, you know, just because there's different manufacturing techniques. And, things. and some better materials. Um, so anyway, that's that one. Then, T frame. I don't know, Adam. You have a. You asked me about this one, the T frame or the A frame or the box frame. You have any, I mean, that's. It just kind of makes more sense in a way to make it a T frame. It seems like it's less material. Um, we can make it an A frame, yeah. in which the T, in which the three wheelers were. I know other people made them that way, and we did. I made some, I made, I made a few chairs that way. And uh, I don't know who was, I think, I 
think Kanab actually did the T-frame thing first. Um, it just kind of made sense, actually, uh, have the straight axle across and one beam out the front and get your legs along the way. It just was less material and uh, less welding, less complication. But it did limit some people. Some people don't like to have the bar between their legs uh, when they have their feet out uh, on footrest or whatever. So it just it, it just made more sense. And now you know it's it, it is better. But then it also there's a lot of chairs getting made for different disabilities now that kind of need that openness in there. It's kind of strange. Is that this guy's missing just one leg and they walk aesthetics or whatever. So they have one big leg and they need it open there. So we're seeing some, we're making some chairs that we didn't make 15 years ago. Like in different positions actually for people that are, because it's a little bit less spinal cord injuries, it seems like. Whatever, different injuries, amputations, like that, however they're caused. Uh, so, but it, it's interesting to see because we are making some different chairs like that. So it's, it's always evolving. So, but, uh, yeah. so um, and then the chair, the chair issues. Um, yeah, I always found it fascinating that people were, uh, whenever you go into the hotel lobby and there's a bunch of racing chairs sitting around, the first thing they do is grab somebody's front wheel and see if the chair wiggles. Little jiggle on the front end. So uh, Adam asked me to talk about the front end slop and who's headset. Uh, yeah, a lot of that has to do with um, kind of the way the chair is put together I and mean, it has to do with how it's manufactured and what components you use but also it's how you put it together um, and if you know how to fix it um, so I can kind of show you here a little bit just some things we do um, most of the chairs that we build here and we're not building a ton of chairs um, but I pretty much either put them together at that point or I disassemble them to ship them and that to me that's if the chair is wobbling around on the front end it's just not good and so you have to make it tight and there's a lot of different ways to do that so I'm going to show you that I can uh, give you some just how we do it on our chair and what matters um, and I can show you how and a lot of the chairs are similar I don't know if everybody's compensator stuff too much I don't stare at people's chairs um, but uh, the ours and the top end chairs are, are kind of similar because that was you know, I mean, this chair is pretty much um, so anyway I'll show you that if you like I can switch it to a different camera is that good <laughs> okay so, I'll have to switch to a different camera here this is all new technology for me. I'm trying to switch the camera. Okay, so go to the other camera. So, look at this camera. Anyway, so this is basically a typical racing chair. Got the fork, steering, uh, you have your compensator, got the spring, spring cylinder, and then you have, everybody has different ways. Can you see the scooter, should I zoom in? It looks great, Chris. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's hard for me to tell. So, I mean, most chairs, every chair, you have to go around the track, you hit it left, you hit it right. You have your, your set screws, you set one for the straightway, you set one for the, uh, 
the corner. Uh, you want to have this tight. You don't want to have it, you know, loose where it's flopping around. Some of them have two nuts that tighten together in this area right here. So you have to lock them together. Uh, we did this different one where we have a big lock nut and we got another secondary screw. Where you tighten it down and then you lock this secondary screw with a different wrench. And you can get it quite tight. It doesn't, it stays tight. Uh, this is one of the biggest nightmares for all wheelchair racers, I think, on the track. This has been. If this comes loose in the middle of the race, whether it's for whatever reason, raining, uh, it just happens. And you can see it in great races. I know there's one Franz Mules block, I think it was in Paralympic, uh, the Olympic exhibition, and it was in the rain, and he was so strong, and then it didn't work. <laughs> like in the last lap, he was just like done. Uh, yeah, it was quite unfortunate. But if you jiggle your front wheel and you feel play, any kind of play, it's either the wheel is crappy or it's typically a spring. And this one is kind of kind of assembly, but this one just needs needs to be tightened. Sometimes people just don't do that. Tight knees. So, okay, I took the play out of there. I took the play out of there. So that's pretty good. Then we have this other one that says you want to change the length for whatever reason. Uh, make it steer. You want it to be more to the left or more to the right. Just blank like this. But so if you do that, then you need to tighten this up. So this little thing needs to be tight. Loosen it up quite a bit. But it uh, needs to be tight against this. So then there's no play. So this one. Now it has pretty much there's no flow. But then the other thing that happens, and this is partly when it's assembled or over a little bit of time, but then we have these two. These uh these two large pieces, and they're typically, this is three quarter inch wrench, a three quarter inch wrench. So if I, this one's not Loctite together, it's typically be Loctite them together. This one's just pre-assembled, so we've got this crease in here on the spring. There's two spacers. There's one inside here, basically the same as this one. So right now, to play. Still play. Still play. It works, but it plays. So your front of your chair jiggles all over. Well, if I get it just right, there's no play. And then typically what we do is we lock tight it together here and here in this threaded area. Red Loctite. You can move it, but it doesn't want to move too much. And then, for some reason, over time, sometimes you get play. So, I can, and then what some people will do is think, well, if I put more tension on it, it will take the play out. And then you get over, you over tighten, and then you create play the other direction. That spring and those two spacers, they need to be, they need to fit in that cylinder in the right place. So, the way we do that ship. So now, it works good. I can't pull it out or anything. Pull it out with the chair, but now the 
there's no play. So if you have play in the front end, it's either these two things are over tightened or under tightened. And it's balanced. Or you don't have this bolt tightened to here. Or this one to here. And that creates a lot of play. And then the other thing is if you have these rod ends, you buy, if you have crappy rod ends, and sometimes you can buy ones that are uh, online or whatever. If they have play in them, you will have jiggle in the front end of your chair. And the same with this side. So it's, uh, if you can take all that out of there, then that's how you get the type from. So, Chris, can you hear me? You hear yeah. me, Chris? So yeah, yeah. we had a question, um, and Kelly was asking, and, and I'm, I don't know if I understand the question uh, completely accurate, but, but she wants to know, tightening the screws on the cylinder, do they do something than tightening the screws on the compensator? So I'm assuming she's talking, referencing the, the stops uh, that, that act um, to set straight the turn on the track versus the tightening screws on the, the spring cylinder. So she just wants to explain the difference, what their, what the, uh, what their intended purposes are and how they're different. I'm not sure which on this part. Sorry, so yeah, right. So those, yep. So I think she wants to know the difference between the, the, uh, the bolts that are uh, utilized to set the straight and the turn on the track versus the, the, uh, the screws on the spring cylinder. Um, so just the difference and, and, and why tightening, what, what the reason would be to, for tightening uh, each of those two. So you explained why you tighten the, the, uh, the nuts um, and um, the spring cylinder, but perhaps then just talk about why you tighten the, the, the screws on the compensator. So different purposes. Yeah, well this one, this is like, it's like two pieces of the chair. You got this piece which goes here. This needs to be put together good with no clay. You know, it needs to be assembled kind of like I showed you, or adjusted, like I said. Everything needs to be tight. You can't loosen this end up without retightening it you know, if you change the length. Um, and then that gets attached here and here. So you have attachment points on the fork, and then you have them attached on Track compensator handle, or whatever you call it, call it different things. But this needs to be attached here. So, like right now, there's no play, I mean, zero. And then you have these two pieces, and some of them have bigger dials. We've kind of gone to a little bit smaller one that you can use. This one, it's a little X head, but you can put a 3 8 wrench on there, you can turn it. Adjust it. So, if I want to go around the corner on the track, it hit, hit it on this side. Chair goes that way. I come back this way, and hopefully, I have this one set for the straight away. Which is straight, corner, straight, corner, straight. Away. And it depends how strong you are. You know, you have to loosen. Have to have a good tension, but the thing you don't want it to do is move around on its own. This thing, you don't want to turn the wheel and this moves. Because then when you go to steer, you steer and that moves and it's not in the same place. And so, so this is really important to have this real tight. The way we do it here. Hey Chris, would you by chance be able to bring the compensator and everything closer to the camera so the fans can see it? Uh, yeah, I can zoom in. Yeah that's, yeah, that's yeah, that's good. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So 
the way ours works. Thought I had all the tools here. I might have missed one. Hang on a second. But this is, uh, this is the locking nut that pretty much everybody has on their chair. We all have different ideas. This one, I'm just going to loosen it up. This one is a three-quarter hex head. I can loosen it up. But it smooths, depending on how I loosen it. Still not so bad, but it moves. I don't want this to move when you need to. Okay, so you want it to be a, a, a way that you can slide it back and forth, the corner and go the straight away. And then you want this to have a good tension. So it depends how strong you are, honestly. Okay, left, right, but you don't want this to unloose. So the way we do it is we have another secondary screw in here. So once you get it tight, and then this pinches it. So it pretty much didn't really change the tension, but it will not get loose. So you can hopefully go around the corner, you know, on a training session. If you do 5,000 meters, Track whatever 13 times, that's the thing. Uh, 13 times four, you know? and so it's a, you don't want to lose up. So, so Chris, if uh, for for someone that doesn't have that type of a uh, mechanism, is what, what kind of tips do you have for that uh, in order to keep that that nut secure when they're using it on the track? Any other any other thoughts or ideas on uh, uh, suggestions? It's you know, it's, I know the way I did it before was not great. Um, this one's kind of worked out pretty good, fairly mm -hmm. good. I just, you need to stay on top of it. And, and, the, and if you have, I think most of them have two locking nuts together. Um, mm -hmm. Or then there's one where there's a bar. I, I don't have super duper tips on that one because I know it's been yeah. a lot of people, honestly. Yeah. But it's not the kind of thing you want to worry about at the last minute when you get to the track man either. You, know, mm -hmm. so you want to you want to work on it ahead of time. Um, I mean, if you have the two locking nuts, you need to tighten it down you know, properly. I know people have put different kinds of uh, washers in there. We tried little strips of leather, etc. This one seems pretty good. We're probably going to increase the size of this bolt, actually, and make even bigger. Exit. It'll be more surface area. I think that will probably even work better. Yeah. Um, but, so yeah, there. Uh, yeah. Well, if, so if, if somebody wants to buy that that locking nut, is that something they can purchase as a as a single piece from you? Yeah, this it, yeah, this is a, it's a locking nut. It's quarter twenty eight thread, um, which is what we've been doing, and I think what my other company was doing. So yeah, this one would fit on there. Um, yeah, we have those, but I am probably like I said, I think in the next generation of things we do, we're gonna probably make it a larger diameter bolt, a little bit bigger hex head. Um, I'll try that. I think that mm -hmm. it kind of makes sense to believe me better. It really won't be. Um, but yeah, yeah that would, I mean, that's, yeah, that will, yeah, that will fit actually. Okay. Yeah, cool. Um, so here, here's a, um, here, uh, Spencer, here's another question. Um, so they want to know, um, let me read through this and I'm going to paraphrase it for you. Um, so they want to know, Chris, so where you have the the collar, uh, the the steering steering arm, where the the spring cylinder attaches to the fork, they want to know how does the placement of that affect the well, they, 
Oh, Steering, turning radius, stiffness. Yep. Mm -hmm. Where this is? Correct. So where, where you have that on that arm, where you position that, where you collar that on the arm, how does that influence steering, stiffness, ease of steering? Yeah, well, if you if I put this all the way out to the end, it has the maximum leverage on the whole setup with this spring. So if I move it in, it will just get easier and easier. And you will be able to turn. Um, so it'll be easier to turn this way. I don't know if steering handle will do this one, uh, but it, it'll be easier to turn more. Um, and you'll have a little bit tighter turning radius. The only problem is the guys that go faster and faster, uh, especially around the corner on the track, if you make it too loose, then you you have the chance, depending on the geometry of the front end, where the wheel will start moving around on its own because you're overpowering it. So you know, you'll, I'm sure you know there's guys that they want one of these where it doesn't even move. You know, especially the 100 meters, or maybe the 200, if that's all they're doing, they don't need to move much. Um, but if you're training on the road, you know, depending on the courses, and if you're, you know, you don't have a lot of power, um, if you put this way out here, it will be stiff. It, it, is, it will be harder to steer. But moving in, it gets easier to steer, and the chair will turn more left and right like for a 90 degree turn. But at the same time, you're really hammering on the chair and it's too loose, you could get wobbled just because mm -hmm. leverage of the wheel touching the ground. So yes, yeah, we're we're yeah. actually we're gonna probably move this back. In the future, about another inch, uh, and then make this a little longer, so the chair can turn more to the left or to the right. It's particularly, with, it's kind of a little bit triathlon based, but with triathlon racers, they run a lot of crazy 5K road courses with the runners, and they have a lot of 90 degree turns. It, it, it needs to turn a little more. That okay, great. Thank you. Yep. I think that's yep, well answered. Um, you can go ahead. I'll uh, we have a few more questions, but move on to whatever your next point of conversation is. Um, yeah, and the other thing with the uh, just how you're on your list, the loose headset. Ours is a little different, but they're, they're kind of just different wrenches. But basically, there's you put the fork on. I'm not going to disconnect the spring, but if I, I'm going to, this is, you see this okay? Take the cap, this is the locking cap. But there's most of the chairs, not all of them. There's a couple bolts here. To, release the steering handle. So now the steering handle is doing nothing because it's too loose, right? Well, a lot of people will put their fork back on the chair and they'll tighten this up before they tighten this up. And so, like right now I have play. So if I tighten this up first, it's like if you just do it backwards, It's like the chair has all this play. I can tighten this up all day long. It still has a play. So you have to keep this loose and then before you can loosen up these two bolts on the other side. Okay. So this is loose. I move it all over the place again. So I'm going to tighten this up. You kind of want to make sure it's straight down the chair. You know, you're sitting in the chair, you don't want your hand over here, over here. So tighten that up. Okay, so even with 
without these two tight, there's no play. So and you tighten this up. People will do that. Um, they'll put it together kind of backwards. So you just take all the play out of the front end. So you have all the, the, the hardware down here that I talked about tight, and you have this tight, and if you have a front wheel that has no play and you have a good hub, you should have a pretty tight front end. That's it's kind of uh, Yep, yep, very good. It's a big important part of the chair, honestly. Like it's you know, people are like, yeah, it's always everybody's always like I said, they always want to get the front end of the chair. Yeah. So, oh well, yeah, that's uh, you know, and you can do this one doesn't have the brakes on it. So there's there. Give you a little pink shot. So, too close, probably. First time I ever did this, it was down. So this one, and all the chairs have a brake on them. I don't know if this is repetitive stuff. Our brake is on the bottom. Uh, this one, the steering wheel is on the opposite. The, the, uh, so anyway, so the, this one has the brake handle here. Um, you can put it on the left hand, left side, right side. Our steering handle goes forward and backwards, uh, so you can get closer to you, farther away, depending on how long you are. Uh, it's pretty much a standard bicycle type brake and a bike brake. That's the standard setup. You could also And you also have this aero type brick lever that we can put it in the uh, you put it in the top of the handle. This can go up in here straight on top so people can push down on it instead of to the side, particularly depending on the kind of glove you have. Um, and we run the cable through here and it comes out and goes down to the So it's a couple different options. And then this piece can also be made in different shapes, depending on again what kind of gloves, what kind of disability you have, and uh, you know, your grip and your power and all those kinds of things. Everybody has a different idea for that. What else we got here, Adam? The uh, rear wheel is back. What was, what was the next one? I'm sorry. You I had a I rear wheel is back. About. The rear wheel is back. Oh, that's right. So. Um, so that, that can be can be an issue too, just as the athletes are pushing that the rear wheels will loosen. So any any tips or suggestions on how to um, prevent that from happening or, or lower the risk of that happening? Well, maybe you, it's very simple. Just do tighten, you think that, tighten them before you get the train. Um, yeah, I mean it, it's uh, 
not a, necessarily a daily thing, but it's it, it it does happen more frequently than than we would like it to. Yeah, it's. Uh... I think, well, one thing, I would put grease in there. That's, I mean, typically in cycling too, if you want things to get tired and come apart, they put grease in. Um, and that does help because it gets a little bit tighter because the grease allows it to get in tighter, and not bind, and then also easier to come out. I, I don't have a great answer for that. You know, like I've rode hand cycles for the last whatever 20 years, and I used we use the same rent, we use the same wheels basically. I don't I don't have a great one for that. It seems like they they just need to be tight. I don't know if yes. the wrench is too short, but I would I mean I wouldn't you know I wouldn't leave them in. There. I would take the wheels on and off. Bit too, I think that's good. Uh, not getting them stuck in there either, but a little grease might help. Mm. Yeah, well, that's all right. Well, that's fair. That's a good, I think that's a, a good intervention strategy is, is to use a grease. Would it, you would think a, like a white lithium grease would be? Uh, yeah, yeah, a white lithium is, grease you can buy at the bike shop or you can just get it at mm -hmm. something. But any, any of the actually, any of the hardware you can use on the Chair is better with grease. I mean, we we've been I, we use it a bit, and then uh, but I know if bike shops, good bike shop, they use like put grease on everything. Um, but it does it does help it go together. It helps to come apart better. It keeps water and corrosion out of there. Um, you know, makes the parts last longer. Sure. Yeah, but yes, yeah, I know we had talked. They had talked about making left-handed thread on the left side and right-handed thread on the right side. But that's just a nightmare because then you have wheels that don't match. You know, for, yeah. yeah, that's fair. <laughs> that's, that's fair. fair. Yeah. You borrow somebody's wheels and they're not the mm -hmm. match. Matches. Yeah, that's, that's a nightmare. Yeah, I, I just think tight wheels. I would. I don't know the little Allen wrenches. Typically, people have short ones. Probably a little longer ones, not a bad idea. Sure. Get a little more leverage. Sure. But yeah, that's, I don't know, I don't, okay. I, I don't, I don't hear a ton of that one. Um, okay. Yeah. But, but anyway. So. Yeah, well, that's great. So we, we got about 15 minutes left. And I, I would really like to have you show everybody a uh, uh, process of, of fitting and, and sizing and, and so when they do order a racing chair, they have some idea of best practices and what, what some of those key measurements are. Um, so we can we can take whatever amount of time you want left uh, remaining in this session to talk about that. And then obviously anything else you wanna wanna touch on too, Chris. Yeah, well that's good. I yeah um, let me just put I just want to sit on here for a second. Um, yeah, the uh, you know the measurement things on the chair. Well, honestly, that's probably the most important thing about the chairs, um, really, because you can have a really great chair, but if it doesn't fit you, it's kind of useless. It's, uh, and I will talk about hand cycles for that one reason. Hand cycles you kind of sit on top of. So if the chair's a little, the bike is a little wide or a little narrow. It's not that big a deal. Racing chair for it to really work properly, you have to sit. Uh, you have to sit on top of it. You have to be inside it. You know, it has to fit you, so you, you don't have the. Uh, you know, you're, it's not too tight on your sides. It's wide, so you can get the reach and the proper stroke. So, typically, when somebody asks if they want to get a new chair, I talk to them on the phone, or they come here, or whatever. Uh, I ask them if they have a chair, and you know, hopefully they do because it is hard to make a new chair for somebody that's never had one, um, unless they have one to try. But the biggest concerns really is you need to 
decide how they can sit, like what's their ability. Uh, you know, can they kneel? Is that possible or not? And then so you can decide what kind of chair to make. But all the chairs, the two things that you have to kind of nail is the hip width and the uh, and the upper frame width. You know, so those are the two that if you get those wrong, the, actually the upper frame width is more important because that's where you get the wheels in. So let me just, I have another frame here with no wheels or anything on it. I can kind of show you. It's not a kneeling chair, but it's probably better. Yeah, that sounds great. Sounds great. Um, I'll, while you're doing that, I'll answer one of the questions, uh, and that was, how do we choose hand ring diameter? Um, I'll share with, with everybody, I, and I share, I'll share the presentation with everybody that I gave yesterday. I talked a little bit about that, and I touched on that. One, one strategy is to may, take a measurement from, you can see, uh, from this knuckle on, on your hand, to the head of the radius here, so right where your elbow hinges. You take that diameter, or I'm sorry, you take that measurement, use that as to advise uh, the, uh, the hand ring diameter selection. So if it's 14 inch, 14 and a half inch, um, that's a good, uh, good strategy to use to, to identify that. Uh, another question was software to fit a wheelchair racer, and, and I'm not familiar with any such software. Um, sounds like an outstanding idea, and and uh, but uh, but none that I'm aware of. None that I'm aware of. Software for what? Software to fit an athlete in a racing chair. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that. One. It would be it would be tough. Yeah, that's a hard one. All right, let me just finish this a little bit here. I just bought this camera the other day, but learning, but it's kind of cool. So about the measurements, you know, there's all the chairs are different in the front. This one's, this is an open V. This is for someone who wanted to uh, sit either they could Toss, they could kneel in this chair, depending on the upholstery you put on it, or they could get a fixed footrest that clamps down below, they put their feet on, um, you know, if they have two larger legs or one, or depending on their knee flexibility or their hip flexibility. Um, but it has the same couple things that are key to all the chairs. And that's the measurement between here and here. And it's at the top, it's between the fenders and the side fenders. So this chair, this chair is 12 inches. So it's a 12 inch chair, and that's measured directly above the axle. Okay, because depending on the camber, it gets wider. So here it's actually about 12 and three quarters more forward. And then if I go to the back, and it's 13, here it's 12, here it's 12 and a half. And that depends on the camber. My guess is this chair is probably, I think 12, or, it's probably 12 degrees. We make about 11, 12 degree chairs, some 13. But this part is the narrowest part. And that's really the narrower you can make this, the closer the wheels will be to you. And you can have a better stroke. If this is too wide, 
your wheels are going to be you're going to be reaching around instead of pushing down straight, depending on your arm length, of course. But there's no there's no need in the world to have your chair wider than possible unless you just can't get through down to the bottom. And then the, the lower hip width we measure into the back, right in the back corner, in between the panels, this is a 13 inch chair. So what we like to do is try to hold 13 or maybe taper in a little bit as it goes to the axle. And then get, maybe we'll get a little narrower, but that's how you measure the lower width. And then, so you need to be able to make, you need, you need to manage width of this and also get your butt down in here. And that's, it's a challenge for some people. Um, and also it depends on how big you are transferring. Uh, you know, people will twist their hips and get down in there. And it's amazing how some chairs can be so small uh, on the top and people will get down in there, but they'll get in there somehow. Uh, because that is really important narrower Chris, can you can you can you show where the upper frame width measurement and the lower frame width measurement occur on the body so um, just as a reference point for those who are measuring without a racing frame um, uh, uh, having that having a race chair available right at the time it's well uh, it's pretty tough there's really, this is where this, this chair, this is where the seat is from the ground. I don't have the order form in front of me, but I'm guessing it's about six, 17 inch seat height. It kind of looks like that. Um, mm -hmm. Right here, down to the floor. So it, it really depends on your ability because the higher the level, the uh, You know, the higher the lesion or the injury, typically you sit lower. Um, you know, so the lower parents, whether they're T12 or incomplete or whatever, they tend to sit high. And then the knees are very low. That's typically, and it also depends on how tall you are. But you want to be able to get your hip bones into a place Depending on the seat height, you don't want your hip bones hitting this bar that uh, the seat sits on. So it's kind of a tough question that you're asking. Um, well, so what I think I think what you're saying is, uh, and may, I didn't ask that very clearly, um, but so you the that lower frame width is going to be the the width of uh, left hip bone to right hip bone, correct? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's, you need to get and you need to protect those bones. So you don't want to make it like in here, you see right here, this is a bar, okay? So you, you would want your hips to sit against this, cut, hanging on this, you know, your bones. It's, they, it's not good, so that, you, know, you need to get it, this at the right height. But typically, this will be lower for higher injuries, like quads, you know, the T-52s, T-51s, depending on what they are, they're way down here. You know, this bar can't be here. So they would have to sit so high. So, but the width of your, it's your hip bones really that want to fit between these two panels, depending on where you put this. And that's kind of for the parents too. Like, yeah. whoever is getting this chair, they can't, that's as low as they're going to be able to sit. Unless right. 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 So um, it does, yeah. And then the the upper frame width. Are you looking at the the, the most the, the bottom most rib left and right? So the, the yeah, I think that's what I call. I kind of do like the lower rib kind mm -hmm. of thing, and even but the, the guys that sit real high, they tend their ribs are totally out of yeah. frame. <laughs> It's like, I don't, I don't, they're, 
they're not down in there so much. But it, I, yeah, it's like your lowest rib or your quad. It's not the way. It, like some people will say, oh, my lats are like 20 inches across because they lift the back mm -hmm. of the gym. It's like, well, you don't sit down mm -hmm. there like that. It's, no, yeah, it's, no. it's more, it is, it's more, it's probably here. Mm -hmm. So the width, you take, you take a measurement of the width from, yep, spanning across your body right at that point. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. we used to have a measurement gauge at, I think at Handcraft of Metals actually, but we had this little adjustment thing, it was George's idea, like, okay, here and here. So it's like the bones here and around here, mm -hmm. but it is it really is subjective to how low or how you sit in the chair. That's why I like yeah. to have people sit in the chair, uh, you know, I want to see them in the chair. And it's, it is much easier to do it that way. It's very, it yeah. is it's tricky better. to do it. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Are there yeah. any other key measurements on on the frame that you 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 well, want to touch yeah, on? The length, like, well, the length is one thing, but I think the length the length of the chair have kind of gotten dialed in. You know, you know, like about a four or six inch range now. It seems like sixty eight inch to seventy four inch. Typically, the uh, you know, the bigger guys will use a bigger chair. They can, if they're more able to, they can handle, they can maneuver the chair around left to right. Um, Cause they're, and they're bigger, so they're not pounding down on the front wheel as much, it's shorter. And uh, so like typically the, the women chairs we make are usually 70, 70 or 72. The men are mostly in the 70, very few, not many, not many chairs get made, at least for us, over 74 inches once in a while. You know. So the length, it's kind of got itself dialed in. Um, so like quads and smaller people use a shorter chair. It's easier to, it's easier to move left to right. Um, but then it also, the, the one you got to nail, kind of, is, uh, um, Yeah, uh, axle position. That's from here to here. The front of the backrest and center of the axle. At least the way we do our reforms. So this chair is eight. It's an eight-inch one, which is pretty. That's honestly that's about at the max that we do. Uh, mm -hmm. We can do longer, but not many people ask for that because if you have a two-car pour, the chair gets incredibly. Yeah, I think we lost, can you, you guys can hear. I think we lost Chris's audio. Can you hear me? Oh, oh we, I got you now. I got you now. Yep, just, I can hear you okay now, I think. Nope, I can't anymore. I might have hit the button. There we go. Now I got you. Okay. Yep. Hang on one second. I have a guy at the door here. Okay. Well, we got we're we're almost wrapping up, so we'll let Chris finish his his thought on on axle position and and um, that placement. And then if you, if you have any more questions, um, we'll have we'll we'll take some, um, and I can follow up with you or Chris can. And and then to any other questions that come up later, you can email me b l e a k n e y at illinois.edu and uh, and we'll get those answered for you. Um, okay, I'm back. So, but we'll, all right, all right. We'll let you finish up with this last, this point and we'll, we'll wrap things up. We can go on for the rest of the day, I know, but, uh, uh, but carry on. I don't know where I was, I knew with the axle position thing. Uh, yeah, it's, this is typically like six to eight inches. Um, again, the, the paras, uh, high paras, T53s, guys that are real high, and, and, and the quads need to put their knees up very high. 
So then the share is going to be incredibly tippy. So those people tend to have it further forward. There's also guys that have real short torsos um, that, that are more able that need it more forward. So it's, there's no rule in a way for everybody, unfortunately. But and mm -hmm. I'm just gonna ask you a question because Daniel, I don't build his chairs, but Daniel appears to me, his chair, his actual position is very short. I don't know if that's correct or not, but it looks like it from the pictures. Is that, and he's, I think he has a short torso. His, um, I'd have to look at his, his, his uh, his uh, order form or his uh, measurements, but um, I think it's pretty standard. He's just he, he's uh, just the way his his body proportionally I think presents um, as such. But um, it just looks like. But it's it's a fairly common fairly common actual position. Uh huh. Yeah. So, but anyway, it's like people are all over the place. Like guy like Ernst Van Dyke, he's a very big guy. I mean, he's able. Very nice MPT. His is around eight, but he sits up a lot, so he has to be careful uh, with the chair being too tippy, especially climbing. So, and again, it depends on the track. Uh, what distance are you doing? You know, guys want to race on the track, do the 100 meters, 200 meters. The start is very important. Um, where on the longer distances, it's not that big a deal. So. It's, yeah, that is that is. Yeah. I think that's really important. Yeah, I I will say that when I, my my standard um, measurement to use is seven inches. If I have an yeah, athlete, that maybe yeah. it's a it's a newer newer chair, maybe their first chair, and and but then if you build adjustability into the the backrest, maybe you don't have a fixed backrest, or even if you do, you just build you build it back, and you can always shim that out with foam if necessary. Um, but but seven inches is my standard. Yeah, that's, I mean, I would say the average is seven, but there are, once in a while, you get some that are all over the place. When I'm, yeah. yeah. People ask me, what about yeah. 10 inches? I'm like, that's not right. That's <laughs> right. something wrong with the picture. Right, right. But the chair, that's right. one thing about racing chairs is they're all over the place. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's, where the hand cycling, you know, we can make two or three different models and they fit like, 80 or 90 percent of the people really uh, right, the right. Chairs, that's good if, you know if you're lucky you know, if you get a bad chair it's hard to sell it or you just you know hand me down or whatever but uh yeah it's because it really is much more difficult to adjust to make it yeah yeah. So. yeah yep and that's the beauty of the sport too the the um uh, that is very unique and and um and very personalized. I think that marriage between the athlete and, and the equipment and, and wheelchair racing gives it a certain elegance and art, um, which uh, which I guess I um, I, uh, I really appreciate. Yeah, for sure. No, it's a big deal. Uh, I always tell it. I don't like telling people this, but when I make chairs for people, that, I made chairs for a lot of people, and some people I've made ten chairs for, three, four, whatever, <laughs> and for some people. Lot. And I, I always used to say, and I still kind of say, is your first chair is your worst chair because you have to build yeah. on it um, because it's right. almost impossible to nail it on the first. I mean, people mm -hmm. will get little tiny incremental changes. Um, mm -hmm. and, and depending on how good they are, it really gets tricky. Um, and, uh, I, Chantel Petitclair, was I built her a pile of chairs. And, the year she, I think, in, was in Beijing when she, that was kind of the end of her career, basically. Um, that year, I, I think I built her three or four chairs. And it was like, she would get, she was like, I wanted a little smaller. And she was like, I'll get in it. I just won't get in it right now. And it would be like <laughs> a quarter inch small. Jeff Adams was like, right. the, like yeah, these chairs would like, come off. It's like, and then the wheels are rubbing, and they're like, well, I'll be smaller. <laughs> like, I'll, I will make Better it work. But the stroke was so good, um, you know, and the chair probably, you know, it was two months after those events, I'm sure the chair probably wasn't yeah. training like crazy. But the chairs right. were. Right. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, um, well, we'll wrap it up. And and Chris, again, I really appreciate your time and expertise. And and uh, there's, I mean, we just scratched the, the surface. Uh, and and uh, but I think I think the info we gave them was was um, hopefully very useful and and potentially some things that that might pop up um, that are not as answered as frequently. I think we covered some things that don't necessarily get covered in in a lot of the the equipment presentations. So hopefully. That was a value, but um, anyway, really appreciate your time, Chris, and um, hopefully we can do something something similar in the future and, and maybe drill down a little bit more and 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 uh, in a little more detail on some of these things. But thanks yeah, again, yeah, really more appreciate time, it. We can focus on some different small stuff or whatever. So, yeah. So. Yeah. Yep. All right. Yeah. Sounds yeah. good. Okay. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks yeah, so much. You. And hope it was okay. Yep. And we will. It was great. Yeah. Oh, outstanding. And we will see everybody tomorrow morning, um, 10 o'clock central time for another role to work out tomorrow. We'll have Brian Seaman on multi-time Paralympian and, uh, all around fantastic guy. So, um, thanks so much. And, and, uh, we'll see you tomorrow. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. Chris.